the one o'clock news from the BBC with Philip Hayton. Good afternoon. Terry Waite is home at last. He stepped on British soil a few minutes ago and is now with the family and friends he hasn't seen for nearly five years. In Germany, the freed American hostage Tom Sutherland says, I've never felt so wonderful in all my life. Today's other news, increased energy output helps the economy to grow for the first time in a year. And the Princess of Wales makes her fourth visit to Northern Ireland. Terry Waite stepped down from the RAF VC-10 a few moments ago, his feet back on British soil for the first time for almost five years. The high winds and heavy rain didn't dampen the joy and the smiles, although it did mean that the former hostage had his first official welcome home inside the aircraft on the tarmac. Lord Runcie, the Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr George Carey, went on board for the meeting. Mr Waite then emerged and was driven to a nearby hangar, where he paid a generous tribute to those responsible for his release. He talked of how support from around the world had sustained him for four years in total isolation. And he finished by expressing his determination to pursue the cause of justice and peace in the Middle East. Emerging out of the gloom, the RAF VC-10 bringing back Terry Waite. He'd requested to be in the cockpit for the landing, anxious to get the first glimpse of home after five years as a hostage. He was said to be in excellent spirits during the five-hour flight from Cyprus, where he'd rested overnight. The nightmare ordeal finally over for the man who disappeared in Beirut whilst negotiating the release of others being held. As the plane taxied to a standstill in quite appalling weather, it was met by the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr George Carey. On board, they welcomed Terry Waite, away from the gaze of the hundreds of journalists and camera crews assembled here at Lynham. Then, after 20 minutes, Terry Waite himself, all smiles, looking remarkably well, although pale and underweight after years of being chained to a wall for nearly 24 hours a day. For much of that time, it was thought he may be dead. He was met by the station commander, Group Captain Ian Corbett, who's overseen previous releases here. Before going on to the officers' mess for private reunions with his wife Frances and his four children, Terry Waite mingled with servicemen and spoke of his ordeal. I think you can imagine that after 1,763 days in chains, it's an overwhelming experience to come back and receive your greetings. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for turning out on such an awful day, but a typically English day, and thank you so much for your welcome. This is uh, an emotional day for me. It's a day when thanks are due to many people. First of all, of course, to the Secretary General of the United Nations and his envoy for their hard and persistent work to seek a resolution to the problem of all hostages who are detained in the Middle East. Also, it's been a particular pleasure for me to meet, a moment or two ago, my old boss, Lord Runcie, <laughs> who, I'm glad to say, is looking as fit and as well as ever, and who, I know, has kept all of us close to his heart and his prayers and his active work in the last years. And he said again that his captors would release other hostages soon. My captors assured me yesterday that in a few days time, Joseph Sisipio and Alan Steen, the two American hostages, will be released. 
They also assured me that Terry Anderson, a journalist of whom the journalistic profession can be justly proud, will be released by the end of this month. Then very public emotions between the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Runcie, and his special envoy. Terry Waite is expected to stay at Lynham for around 10 days, taking his first tentative steps back to some form of normality. And joining me from RAF Lynham now is our reporter, Jenny Bond. Jenny, where is Terry Waite now? Is he with his family? That's where he is, over in the VIP suite, yes, in the officer's mess. But we've had the most extraordinary scenes here, as, as you've witnessed yourself. The atmosphere is really quite hard to describe. We didn't expect him to speak at such great length. No one else has. I, I think John McCarthy perhaps wanted to. Jackie Mann, I think, wasn't fit enough. But Terry Waite has demonstrated both, both the will and the way. It was a real tour de force. It was really a, a list of thanks to everyone who was involved in, in the years that he's been in captivity. He said so little about himself and his own suffering. I mean, he even came perilously close to thanking Hezbollah for having found him some clothes yesterday. Though apparently the RAF did a great deal better and found him his size 14s, he said, within half an hour. And there were the serious points to the uh, very grave plea for those who are left in the Middle East to be freed as soon as possible. And he said the church would not rest until those people were released. Thinner and greyer, but still very much the old Terry Waite. Absolutely, laughing and joking, and to see him walk amongst the reporters and the crowd here was really extraordinary. He was throwing his shoulders back and laughing. I thought he looked as if he might have been limping a little. Maybe those were the size 14 shoes he wasn't used to, I don't know. But he certainly looked a great deal fitter than uh, last night. And the strength of his voice and the, the, the eloquence with which he spoke really has amazed everyone. Have you heard anything about his flight from Cyprus? What did he do on the plane? Uh, I. I think that he was awake most of the time. I don't have very many details, but I do know that it was his own request to go and sit up there between the pilot and the co-pilot so that uh, he could take the first look at British soil, such as it is today. And what of the future now? What, what of the next week or ten days? Well, at the moment, as we've said, he will be reunited now with his wife Frances and their four children. I think it, it's worth pointing out that he took a good 15 minutes to talk to us before he went to see them and how much he must want to see them. Uh, the medical team, as uh, is the custom now, will be taking things extremely slowly at Terry Waite's own pace, but the medical debriefing does have to go ahead, and it will do, gradually, over the next period of days. He may be under advice to stay here for 10 days, as John McCarthy and Jackie Mann did. From what we've seen, it looks to me as if he may stay rather, rather less day, time than that. What good news. Thank you very much, Jenny. Terry Wade's return home has been greeted by celebration and thanksgiving across the country. Churches throughout Britain have been invited to chime their bells at 7 o'clock this evening in a nationwide gesture of thanksgiving. Friends and neighbours from his local community in Blackheath in South London can hardly wait to have him back. The bad weather couldn't deter local people in Blackheath from coming out to mark Terry Wade's safe homecoming. A hugely popular local figure, People here have felt his absence and his family's suffering. Now there's a mood of celebration. Obvious, everybody's so thrilled, aren't they? Just give everybody a lift on these grotty times. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was out last night, so I haven't seen him. I haven't yet seen no. him. I can't wait to see him. I tell you, this is, was the best day of my whole life yesterday. I think as for all the people, he's probably been, had the worst time because he spent such a long time on his own. Um, so I think it must be fantastic for him to come back and just hope that he recovers and gets over it. The local florist has done a brisk trade in yellow ribbons. They've all been coming in, mainly for yellow flowers to take to the church, Thanksgiving for his safe return, and for the other hostages as well. And you're delighted? We are, thoroughly. Good morning. At the Blackheath Church Army, they're getting ready to welcome back one of their own. Captain Terry Waite has been a member for over 30 years. In many ways, he would have given hope to a lot of other people who are going through dark times. So I think he would have coped pretty well. He would have had his bad moments because he's human the same as the rest of us. Local residents will be gathering tonight for a service in Terry Waite's local church to give thanks for his safe return. Well, joining me now from Terry Waite's local church, All Saints, Blackheath in South London, is the vicar. 
the Reverend Henry Bergen, who's a close family friend. Well, what's it like to have uh, Terry Waite back home? Well, it's quite incredible. I don't think one can put into words exactly what one feels. Uh, there's a great sense of excitement about the whole event, and uh, uh, certainly the community are, are putting the flags out, literally. And what about, uh, what personal impression did he make on you, that speech at the uh, at RAF Lynham? I think that was remarkable, because anybody who has be been kept in confinement as long as he has, and under the stresses and strains which go with that, to make a speech of that nature must have cost a great deal. And I, I was amazed that he was able to do it. What will your first words be when you finally meet? I'm looking forward to that occasion very much, and I think my first words will be welcome home. We're delighted to have you back. How will you be celebrating his return? Well, this evening we do have a service here in Blackheath for him in the church. It will be a Thanksgiving, a Eucharist, and uh, that will be our main act of worship now. But we also expect to have a Songs of Praise here next Sunday. And as Terry Waite uh, starts to pick up the pieces of his old life, what, what advice would you offer to him? I think to go very gently at first, because obviously there have been tremendous strains and stresses, not only for him, but for his family over a long period. And he will need time and space to make the adjustments to living with freedom. It's not easy, and of course many of the stresses and strains are hidden beneath his marvellous personality. Hostages often say that uh, their period of incarceration enhances their zest for life. That almost seems impossible, doesn't it, for Terry Waite? Oh, no. I think as a man of great faith, he will be looking for every opportunity to lead an active and vigorous life. So I, I think very often when people are put under pressure, or, uh, uh, they respond in a very positive way, and as certainly Terry will. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. The other freed hostage, the Scottish-born American Tom Sutherland, will be reunited with his wife and two of his daughters later today. He's resting at a U.S. Air Force hospital at Wiesbaden in Germany. On his arrival there early this morning, he said he'd never felt so wonderful in all his life. Tom Sutherland's daughter Joan caught a first glimpse of her father on television last night. Oh, he looks so good! Later, he emerged from the gloom of six and a half years in captivity to the Wiesbaden Air Force Base in Germany, with hopes for the quick release of the remaining hostages. I'm very, very happy that it's over for so many of us by this time, but uh, I just keep my fingers crossed that nothing bad will happen between now and the time that the other three get out. But it certainly looks now, from where we were sitting there in, uh, in the Beka, that they do intend to, to set everybody free very shortly. It's become an embarrassment to them to keep on holding hostages. And they've discovered that it's, it doesn't pay. There seem to be flowers everywhere and human contact of a kind he's not had for too long. A royal welcome which overwhelmed the modest Scots-born American. I've never felt so wonderful in all my life as I do now. They treated me in the U.S. Air Force as though I were a king. And here I am only just a lonely hostage. And watching from her hospital bed, his niece predicts Tom will finish the job he started. Well, as far as we're aware, he actually intends to go back to Beirut and carry on teaching at the American University there, believe it or not. Would you try and stop him? Well... I mean, I think really if that's what he's set and doing, no one's going to stop him. A very determined person. Here's to Tom. Here's. Tom Sutherland's large Scottish family were celebrating his release late into the night. Soon they'll see him for real. Now more on Terry Waite's homecoming. I'm joined from RAF Lynham by the pilot of his airplane, Wing Commander David MacDonald. What sort of flight did he have? He had a very good flight. He was very buoyant. I must correct you though, I'm the aircraft commander. The captain was Flight Lieutenant Mike Porter. Uh, but he was very buoyant. We put him on the flight deck for the takeoff from Akrotiri and for the landing into Lynham. I have to say it was a fairly uh, rough approach purely because of the high winds and the, the, the bad, very bad weather at the moment. What did he say to you during the flight? Oh, lots really. He was um, wanting to talk about the Air Force and uh, generally how things were. Um, he was delighted absolutely with uh, the reception on the aircraft 
Um, at one stage when we were trying to link him and the Prime Minister together with a, an in-flight uh, telephone conversation, uh, we finished that and then went straight into a champagne reception in flight. So uh, he was quite happy. And he wanted to be in the cockpit for the landing. Yes, he did, very much so. He was very interested in what was going on. And thoroughly enjoyed the view over the Alps and uh, the rest of Europe as we uh, came across. And not at all depressed by that English weather? No, not really. Not at all. Very buoyant. Commander, uh, Wing Commander, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. With Terry Waite's release, there's new hope for the six Westerners still held in Lebanon. In his press conference at RAF Lynham, Mr. Waite repeated that he'd been told the American journalist Terry Anderson could be free by the end of the month. Fellow Americans Joseph Sicipio and Alan Steen could be out even sooner, possibly within five days. And Mr. Waite said he hoped the two German hostages, Thomas Kempner and Heinrich Strubick, would be free by the end of the year. A sixth hostage, Italian businessman Alberto Molinari, is believed to have died in captivity. There's no sign, however, of any further release of Arab prisoners held by Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister has said that won't happen until he gets news of Israeli servicemen still missing in Lebanon. The process has started, but for the Israeli government, there's a long way to go before they can declare a successful outcome to this grim business. So far, the coffin of Samir Assad, returned and buried in September, is the only physical sign of progress for Israel. There is information that two more missing Israelis are dead, but their bodies have not been returned. Today, Israel is concentrating on the case of Ron Arad, an airman shot down in 1986, whose family still wait in the hope he will return home alive. A hope encouraged now by very firm claims from senior Israeli officials. Ron Arad is alive, and Ron Arad we know uh, in whose hands he is. And we know that that government can take a decision and release Ron Arad. Uh, he has a family here. It's very important that he returns. The government referred to by Mr. Bain is presumably that of Iran, backer of many of the Muslim prisoners held by Israel. The deal is obvious. If further releases are to take place, then the Israelis must first hear news about Ron Arad. Then even their Trump card, the Muslim cleric Sheikh Abed, could go free. We have committed, and you know we stand by that commitment, to release all the Lebanese prisoners that we uh, hold or that we can uh, influence their release in southern Lebanon. It's very simple. There's no reason why it can't be done. In fact, I'm saying right now, let it be done. So Israel is not giving up hope. The chief hostage negotiator, Yuri Lubrani, is reported to be in Paris, continuing his diplomacy. Israel's behind-the-scenes involvement in the whole business continues. In public, though, it's a familiar hard-line position. No change in the Israeli stance until the other side makes a move. One Israeli official said, they know what we're waiting for. Justin Webb, BBC News, Jerusalem. Lord Runcie said today he was convinced of Mr. Waite's integrity in dealing with the Beirut hostage takers. But he said his envoy may have become an unwitting pawn in a larger game being played by the US government and Colonel Oliver North. Our foreign affairs editor John Simpson looks at the events behind the kidnapping of Terry Waite. For some time, the facts about Terry Waite's involvement, however innocent, with the CIA and its operations in Lebanon before he was kidnapped, have been held back. No one wanted to prolong Mr. Waite's imprisonment, nor to put his life in any more danger. Now, though, some of the details are coming to light. The involvement seems to have been twofold. Firstly, there was the question of the American hostages who were released in 1985 and 86, the Reverend Benjamin Weir, Father Jenko, David Jacobson. Mr. Waite was given the public credit for their release. What wasn't known until the Tower Commission investigated the Iran-Contra affair, and Colonel Oliver North later gave evidence in public about it, was that the Americans had bought the freedom of the three men with a total of 2,000 anti-tank missiles urgently needed by Iran in its war against Saddam Hussein. The links between Mr. Waite and Colonel North have long been clear. He and I were in touch on a number of occasions when he went to Beirut in great danger. Uh, in fact, he called me at one point from Beirut uh, while his hotel room was under fire. And uh, I'm well aware of the, of the great jeopardy that he was willing to place himself uh, for the safe return of those being held captive. But did Mr. Waite know about the underlying deal? Yeah, I can say categorically that I told Terry Waite absolutely nothing about the fact that we were exchanging weapons with the Iranian government. 
and yet uh, at any point in time but the Conservative MP and writer on intelligence matters, Rupert Allison, believes Mr Waite did know something of what was going on. Oh, there's absolutely no doubt that in the middle of December at 1986, when he was warned that his uh, role as an independent intermediary had been compromised, uh, he knew that to go back to Beirut would be putting his, li his life on the, on the line. Because he knew that the Americans had swapped arms hostages? Emphatically so. The second aspect of Mr. Waite's involvement was over the kidnapping of the CIA station chief in Beirut, Bill Buckley, in 1984. Mr. Buckley was later killed and his body was taken to the United States for burial. Under torture, he had revealed a great deal about CIA activities in Lebanon. Terry Waite went to Beirut to try to get Buckley released, without in all probability knowing of his position in the CIA. Terry Waite went into the jungle of Beirut knowing that he'd been hopelessly compromised, but how aware he was of the precise detail is still not clear. And after the sheer pleasure of seeing him free again, these are questions he'll no doubt want to answer. Other news now. The Princess of Wales has flown into Northern Ireland amid tight security. She said Terry Waite's release was wonderful news and added that she'd been following the reports closely. Her visit follows one of the most violent weeks in the province for years. Just hours before she arrived, an IRA car bomb was diffused in Belfast city centre. The Princess of Wales spoke about the freeing of Terry Waite at the first engagement of her one-day visit to Northern Ireland at a Barnardo Centre in Belfast. <laughs> The Princess of Wales' expression of delight at the release of the last British hostage came in the middle of royal... She was at Barnardo's to open a nursery and parent support unit. At... She met parents and children who use the unit in Northern Ireland, as the Waite family have many... One of the hostages already released is Brian Keenan from Belfast. It's the second visit she's made to Northern Ireland this year and she'll be at a number of other... The economy is showing signs of... Rec a rise in oil and gas production... ...time in over a year, although the rest of industry... The Chancellor welcomed the news, but Labour's John Smith said the... For the Liberal Democrats, Alan Beath said... 